Good afternoon, everyone. It's, my name is Rolo Jowie. I'm an associate professor here at Cradle. It's my absolute pleasure to be chairing this um, final closing session for the inaugural Cradle Conference. Um, I'm calling it inaugural. We'll be having more, I'm sure. It's been such, such an excellent experience. Um, and it really was set up to celebrate five years of Cradle. Um, and so do stick around for the book launch at six where David Bauer, Margaret Beerman and um, Professor Beverly Oliver will be talking about our latest book, um, Reimagining University Assessment in a Digital World. But for now, it's my absolute great pleasure to um, be chairing this keynote by Professor Monica Nerland. Um, and Professor Nerland, um, is Professor of Education and Leader for the Headworker Research Group for Studies in Higher Education and Work at the University of Oslo, Norway. Um, she specialises in research in higher ed and professional learning, which is really where I came to um, really interact with her work. And it's always very thoughtful and it explores the ways in which knowledge cultures constitute practices of learning, teaching and assessment. Um, and it uses quite um, strong theoretical framings to do so. Um, and so before I introduce Monica to start her keynote, I would like to acknowledge, um, acknowledge the lands on which we meet. As we gather for this meeting, physically dispersed and virtually constructed, let us take a moment to reflect on the meaning of place and in doing so recognise the various traditional lands on which we do our business today. We acknowledge the elders past, present and emerging of all the land we work and live on and their ancestral spirits with gratitude and respect. Um, and I'd like to particularly acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, which is where I'm based up today. Um, and so with that, I would like to stop sharing my screen to start with. <laughs> um, sorry, yeah, perfect. Thank you, Paige. Um, and move to Monica to present her talk. Thank you, Monica. So oh, thank you very much for this uh, invitation to, to talk at the Cradle 5th year anniversary conference. And um, I'm honored to, to meet people virtually here and uh, also to present this talk. And uh, I would like to start also to congratulate the Cradle Center on your anniversary. Uh, it's a very nice five year old, I think. And I do hope that you will have a long and healthy and productive life. Um, this talk will address how digital technologies generate changes in professional knowledge practices, which again urge us to rethink relations between higher education and work. I will focus on knowledge practices because I think there is a need to bring the content dimension back to discussions of education and learning in digitalized environments. Uh, not content as a stable feature then, but rather um, a focus on the ways we generate, share, assess and mobilize knowledge in different uh, work settings and the way these processes are recognized as expert work. And these practices, I will argue, are transformed in significant ways when digital tools and representations are taken into use. I will use examples from professional learning because one, these are the areas where I have done most of my own research. Uh, and second, uh, because I think these areas are particularly interesting knowledge areas when it comes to changes in work practices and the role of higher education. The themes and perspectives will however have a wider relevance. I will start with some introductory reflections on debates on digitalization in higher education. Then I will talk about a perspective on professions as expert communities, which are formed by distinct ways of generating and sharing knowledge. This is followed by a discussion of how digitalization contributes to present new epistemic challenges to professionals, 
Uh, and I use some examples from recent and ongoing research in our group here in Oslo. I then raise the question of what role higher education may take and conclude by suggesting that thinking of professional communities in terms of epistemic practices may help us moving beyond what has sometimes become a divide between educational work and see rather we can see expert communities as the frames for knowledge processes and learning instead of focusing solely on the different organizational environments. So to the debates on digitalization in higher education. I recognize that this may look a bit differently in different country contexts. Uh, and I'm sure that the Australian context is rather far ahead uh, with all the experience you have in di digitalized and online teaching. Um, but the way I know it, at least, um, there has been a lot of interest and uh, attention in higher education debates to what we can form more call more generic communication platforms and generic tools to facilitate the kind of delivery of education uh, and also ways of following up students on a distance. So um, the technologies like Moodle, MOOCs, collaboration platforms as Microsoft Teams, lecturing in Zoom, uh, digitalizing libraries, resources, and so forth for the use of all students and teachers in higher education. But equally important, I think, are the changes in the knowledge practices and learning that are domain specific, which has to do with the use of new instruments in practice. It may be about data-driven ways of monitoring services in a specific occupation. It might be about automated decision making, the use of computational techniques in areas that previously were relying on more qualitative forms of information and judgment, and um, the way also uh, shared information platforms in professional services generate changes in how responsibilities are distributed, for instance, between professionals and clients. So this might be about uh, interaction platforms in schools, in healthcare, in accountancy, and so forth. And uh, digitalization has also to do with um, what opportunities are available for students to access knowledge and take part in learning processes. So how students navigate and connect informa information environments, how they regulate their participation and move along the pathways of knowledge that are available in their prospective field of expertise is also a key question. So um, I think that there has been less attention in the public debates to the latter issues here. Uh, teachers and the professionals might be very well involved in these things as well, but the poli policies and debates on higher education development has focused very much on the more generic technologies. Um, but uh, it's perhaps the more also domain specific use of technologies that really change epistemic practices or ways of doing knowledge and the learning requirements and opportunities that come with it. So um, sometimes I also have the feeling that domain specific developments are really important within the specific areas. For instance, how you develop computational thinking in mathematics or how you use new equipment in a biology lab. Um, but these things tend to stay within the disciplinary community, uh, perhaps both in practice and in research. So um, one argument and starting point for this talk is that I think we need to attend to these epistemic dimensions of technologies and the digital environments and activities in order to also discuss productive relations between higher education and work. So what then is distinctive for professional knowledge and professional expertise? Christopher Winch, a philosopher, um, he describes professional expertise as a specialist field of occupational activity. And he underscores how the performance of professional activities are um, very much assessed and 
recognized by fellow experts. Uh, and this happens to a fine and discriminating degree, as he says. So expertise is performed and it's recognized by colleagues that are fellow experts. Um, professional expertise also rests on quite different forms of knowledge and knowing. Uh, it might be theoretical knowledge, conceptual knowledge, experience-based knowledge, um, practical procedures that people uh, develop skills to bring forward. And these different ways of knowing needs to become integrated and applied in different work contexts. As colleagues in Sydney, Lina Markus Kaita and Peter Gudier has also written about. So um, what kind of knowledge ability that is required to be recognized a professional is then not stable. It will change with the practices and the type of work people are doing. And um, the ways we generate and develop knowledge and also the way we enact expertise take distinct forms within different expert cultures. Today, the complexity of actors and activities that take part in these expert cultures are growing in complexity. So um, if you look at what type of actors, what activities, what is the set of uh, processes that contribute to generate knowledge in a domain or field of expertise. Um, these are um, increasing in the number of actors and also often in the complexity because there might be different concerns, uh, different um, value systems at play, different ambitions. Um, so this illustration is just to uh, show some of the type of actors that can be involved. For instance, uh, when it comes to defining and informing what can happen in healthcare practices. So professional ed education is, of course, an important um, area and set of actors here but also different kinds of stakeholders, uh, technology developers and providers, research communities, user groups. Um, user groups may also um, organize and form what we can call interest groups and epistemic communities. For instance, uh, organizations of patients that try to um, influence specific type of healthcare and priorities. In our work in Oslo, we have used a notion from the sociologist Karin Knorsetina, who describes expert cultures as formed by what she calls machineries of knowledge construction. Such machineries, not machines, but machineries, comprise the different arrangements, instruments, strategies, ways of doing knowledge that form what we know uh, at a certain time and make up how we know what we know. So such machineries, they typically span organizational boundaries for instance, between higher education and work. Um, they are sustained and changed through the enactments of actors in many different settings. And these machineries also manifest in the practices people enact when they are engaging with knowledge, assessing knowledge, finding ways of approaching new knowledge, for instance, for use in work settings. So if we then turn the lens to practices, we can say that expert communities are also then constituted by the type of epistemic practices or knowledge practices uh, by which knowledge is generated and shared in a given field of expertise. How people come to know what they know, how they can ex access new uh, knowledge that are of relevance for their field, um, and how also the knowledge is distributed for different type of activities in a professional setting. Uh, Kelly describes also epistemic practices as socially and interactionally accomplished ways that members of a group propose, communicate, justify, assess and legitimate knowledge claims. So these type of actions and the standards and rules that comes with them can be seen as knowledge practices. 
the way we can communicate about knowledge, the way we can justify that something is better to do than something else, the way we assess new research-based inputs, the way we legitimate knowledge claims and the practices that are carried out. Epistemic practices also are critical for making theoretical knowledge and, for instance, research-based knowledge actionable in different work contexts. And they are needed to assemble different resources, to translate between a general standard and what happens in a local setting. And they are also used to represent parts of the world that we want to work on in a moment. For instance, how do we represent um, the inner side of the body in a healthcare situation in order to work on that type of medical problem? In the post-digital area, we could say that the epistemic complexity of these practices in many ways are increasing. Digitalization affects the way we generate, share and justify knowledge. For instance, we can see more abstract representations and symbolic inputs. People work on abstracting an experienced problem uh, to be able to work on it, for instance, as a programming team in this abstraction column here. Uh, and then re they reinsert a solution in whatever they try to build of a type of program, for instance. Visualization technologies come forth in many domain domains, and these make it quite interesting um, to look at how people interpret information and share and communicate insights. So when we use graphs or different types of visual technologies to to represent what we are working on. It also comes with analytical challenges and uh, a need to be able to uh, read those symbols and make sense of them. Computational thinking comes forward also um, in the digital and post-digital era, we could say, um, and generates change in many knowledge practices. One example might be um, the field of biology where actually um, statistic techniques and computational processes have become more and more important to, for instance, map ecologies in the nature, rather than um, acting directly and in a qualitative way in fieldwork. And automation, of course, is a big debate. And this affects work not only in the sense that workplaces disappear, I think equally important is that automation changed the distribution of tasks and responsibilities and makes trust in knowledge and trust in actions um, becoming an important issue. Automation is also a key uh, issue for learning because through automation processes, important actions in these epistemic machineries might be black boxed. They are kind of locked into technology and humans might not be fully aware of what is going on in the algorithm, um, for instance. And what the basis for judgments might also then become less transparent. So challenges to professional expertise in this light. They are many, uh, but some of those I will highlight here is that working with advanced technologies and representations in different areas are really cognitively demanding. And um, this means that um, different type of higher cognitive processes are at play, interpreting information from abstract symbol systems, uh, being able to analyze a lot of different type of information, um, and moving between this level of abstraction and the concrete actions people are involved in. Um, they also increase the need for what we can call system understanding. Um, so while in the industrial age, it was perhaps um, sufficient to take care of your working task in a type of uh, production context, now more people need to understand how their task is situated in the wider uh, production context. What are other people doing and what is happening elsewhere that in, informs and are linked to what I am doing. 
And this, again, um, generates a need to be critically aware of this wider epistemic machinery. How are things working together to produce these services or these um, ways of uh, understanding? We see also that people face extended responsibilities for knowledge, so that um, for instance, in professions like nursing and teaching, uh, people are no longer only executors of given knowledge, but they're often asked to contribute to uh, analyze their work environment, to develop the practices with colleagues, to link up with new advancements and so forth, which, which requires that they master the ways of doing knowledge or the epistemic practices in their work settings. And establishing and managing social relations are also becoming more complex. So these are relations to user and clients in many cases, also to other professionals with different type of background, uh, to different areas and perhaps levers, levels of leadership and their demands, and to a growing diversity of stakeholders. To give some examples from an ongoing project we are conducting in Oslo, um, this project is called Corpus, Changing Competence Requirements in Public Services, and it focuses on digitalization and changing demands to professional expertise in the municipality health sector. It has been running for about a year now, and as you can imagine, we have faced some delays and trouble during the pandemic. Uh, for instance, when fieldwork literally closed down in March. Uh, so we are a bit delayed in um, relation to our original plan, but we are now up and going again. And the project as such will be running until early 2024. One of the things we are looking at in this project is the introduction of smart care technologies in the health sector. These are technologies that monitor and send notices uh, about the condition of users and allow the users to take more responsibilities for their own care, perhaps in their home. Here it's illustrated with a padlet displaying what is called a roommate system, which monitors users in their home and send alerts when, for instance, the user is lying on the floor or being inactive for a um, too long time. And um, in this respect, in the organization of the introduction of such technologies in our municipality, uh, they have a new working group installed that is called Care Technology Coordinators. This is a, a quite new group of workers. Uh, it's not a, a title that we know from a long history, but it's a more function. Uh, people who take up these roles are often nurses or um, uh, therapists or even interaction designers. Uh, and their role is to manage the connection between technology providers, care workers, the users, and also to their professional leaders, and even they negotiate issues upwards towards political leaders in the municipality. We have seen now that this group of workers, they do not have a work description. It's not given what they should use their time for. They have to craft their own working roles, and they engage a lot in trying to force in new future opportunities and to reorganize the services so that they can adapt to technological advancements. This illustrates a need for system understanding and it also illustrates the way expertise is extended to a range of new roles and type of competences which includes capacities to manage many type of relations to various stakeholders. So this also provides challenges to professional learning. Um, the access to observe and participate in knowledge practices has for a long time been seen um, as important in professional learning through apprenticeship models, situated learning ideas and so forth. Um, but what happens then when practices and operations are not anymore fully transparent? When, for instance, 
digital technologies play an important role in these practices and take care of operations previously done by humans, it might be difficult actually to get access to observe and participate fully. I will come back to this in a minute. Uh, another type of challenge has to do with the balancing the specialization in expertise and the capacities to work with others. We can see an expansion of demands in many directions and an abundance of knowledge that comes in in many fields. So challenges to learning is also about what to leave out, when to specialize and how to combine these different areas. And the capacity to navigate complex information environments become also a key challenge to professional learning. Um, for instance, both students and professionals may move many places in the online and, uh, and physical world to learn. Um, and these opportunities are very much related to digital infrastructures and tools. How the different resources are combined com in a meaningful way is important for the learning. How they can know where to go what to trust, and so forth. To give another example, um, when it comes to this issue of um, black boxing and hiding different ex expert operations, we can see that learning challenges are related to access and transparency. And um, how can then professional get access to necessary knowledge and skillful practice in order to train and to develop? How can what we call uh, legitimate peripheral participation be offered in very technology dense practices? Some of you may know about the work of uh, Matthew Bean at the University of California, Santa Barbara, uh, who has discussed how robotic surgical skills can be developed in settings where the novices cannot really take part in the advanced operations before they are experts but becoming an expert require access. So this uh, needs workarounds in order to get access to things that are hidden. In our corpus project, again, we also look into a project where a group of developers and different types of professionals are engaged in building an advanced information system for information sharing. And um, I recognize that this figure has a Norwegian text, but uh, it's not needed really to read that. Um, but the point is that this is a type of information system for information sharing across units in the healthcare sector. So between hospital doctors, general practitioners, home care workers, users, their relatives, and so forth. And there is a manifold of technologies and repositories that and services that are envisioned to work together to secure the patient care and the patient's information. For those who are involved in the development of these information processes and systems, um, the system is relatively transparent. They know what goes in in the programming and algorithmic uh, work. They know where information travels and they know more or less what are the basis for the kind of advices or um, advices for decisions that come out of the system. But for the workers who are to take this into use in, for instance, the home care settings, the information might be much more black boxed. The category systems at play might not be clear to them. Um, the emphasis on structured and standardized data that such a system actually um, requires might feel very um, different from the situation where they actually provide uh, physical care to a user or patient. So the distance between the experiences at hand and what um, are embedded of information in this system and how that is organized might feel quite um, far away. And sharing information from these multiple systems also um, pose demands to categorization and uh, advanced cognition exercises in abstracting information and moving between the abstract and the concrete. So what then about universities and higher education? How can higher education think about these issues? 
with all the historical heritage and archives of established knowledge that are also important. Uh, and this now faces the need to meet new demands for communicating and accessing um, information and learning resources. In order to address both current challenges to professional expertise and challenges to professional learning, I propose that we think of higher education as a matter of enrolling students in evolving knowledge cultures. And enrolling is then not um, thought of as a socializing process into a stable world, but rather as an ongoing process of becoming through being involved in the way knowledge is done and shared in the domain of expertise. So access to and participation in epistemic practices that are important in the domain are then important for such enrollment into the professional cultures. And this again requires awareness of the wider machinery. So students should be introduced to ways of working and ways of doing knowledge, but increasingly they also need to understand more of the wider machinery which their work is a part of. For instance, where does this evidence-based advices come from? What kind of actors are behind different types of technology and so forth? Another example from a previous project in our group um, was a project that directed attention to higher education practices in three domains, in law, in teaching and in software engineering. The project was called Horizontal Governance and Learning Dynamics in Higher Education. And in the part of the project where we entered educational activities, we had the following research questions. How do students within these programs take part in epistemic practices and also exploration of objects, the type of problems that are important to work on in their domain? And what role do the epistemic practices and these objects play in linking educational activities with the wider epistemic machinery? And um, we entered different course settings. Among those were introductory courses in all these domains, where all these courses um, relied on type of inquiry activities. So students were organized in groups to explore and inquire and produce something as a learning exercise. We looked into what type of epistemic practices in the second column here um, were important to learn to do in order to work in these ways as aspiring professionals. And from just these uh, red colored words, you can see that epistemic practices are quite different in different areas of expertise. Um, we also looked at what type of knowledge sources and instruments and technology use were involved and how these different activities generated different what we call transformative means. What were the ways, the mechanisms of enrollment of the students which made the students move from one state to another in their um, beginning trajectory as becoming professionals. And um, when we link this to the ideas of knowledge practices and epistemic machineries, we saw that both the legal education domain and the software education uh, program highlighted very much uh, procedural ways of working, tools and methods for doing problem solving, legal methodology and programming exercises with the use of profession specific um, instruments and knowledge sources. And these um, methodological um, activities and procedural activities um, were very helpful in the students' way to transform uh, themselves as begin beginning professionals, but also in getting um, acquaintance with prime practices and resources in the professional domain. 
In the teacher education case, in this exercise, they worked more on conceptual knowledge and the materiality was not so present and they didn't use much technologies other than some Google Docs uh, working together documents and uh, some textual sources on the net. And um, we saw then that actually those areas which linked the students more to the tools and materialities and then the also infrastructures of sharing knowledge in the domain. These students also developed an awareness of the wider machinery. What did the Supreme Court do for lawyers? Where are the technology providers and the different professional areas where software developers can access knowledge, for instance? Well, the teacher education students here were more um, confined to their local um, work environments, but uh, worked on transition uh, and transition from being a former student to starting to see themselves in the teacher role. So, um, these enrollment mechanisms with providing access to epistemic practices and the relations to the wider machineries are important for enrollment. Another way of rethinking what higher education can do is to attend to students' navigation and their ways of constructing spaces for learning. This is an area where lots of interesting things are going on at the moment, I think. I know several people are working in, in Australia about these topics. And in our group, I also have colleagues, Kirina Damsa, Rachel Esterhasi, Andres Moya, who have their uh, current um, research activities in this area. So looking into how students actually construct spaces for learning by moving around in both professional and educational environments are important. And a third issue is uh, the challenge for educational programs to stay in interaction with the work context and keeping pace with an evolving field. And to develop productive relations between the sets of epistemic practices and resources in education and work settings. I think there is a need to um, not think about these areas as organizationally bounded binary areas, but rather to look at what are the epistemic expert communities here? What are the resources, the processes, the practices that students and professional alike have in common? And then to use that way of thinking to um, look at the profession or the expert domains as the frame for educational activities, rather than um, being too focused on the different organizational environments. But these ways of keeping up with the field might also take very specific forms in different domains, which means again that the relations need to be worked on in the program levels and in on the activity level, so to speak. And not, for instance, as we have done in Norway, we have a kind of council for work relations for the universities placed at the top level of the organization next to the rectorate, which ensures that it's re released really from all domains. So uh, these relations need to be worked on in the practices and probably in the faculties, departments and program levels. So to conclude, I think there is a need to rethink how we look at education and work relationships and to move beyond the dichotomy uh, that we sometimes see comes up between education and work. Uh, the discussions of the post-digital are among other things also highlighting the need to overcome dichotomies between the real and the virtual, between the digital and the human, between the pedagogic and the authentic and so forth. And perhaps we should add to this list that we also need to go beyond uh, the boundary between higher education and work. And um, through the lens of expert cultures and practices, we can acknowledge that professionalism is something that are worked on from different institutional environments, different actor sets, and it needs to be continuously achieved and done and redone in a collaboration between the different actors in the epistemic machinery. So if we look at the sustainability 
from the professional community side. Um, these are actually dependent on um, practitioners' capacities to keep knowledge moving, to keep on exploring and evaluating knowledge claims, to keep on developing practices, and this should be a joint commitment for communities in higher education and work. Thank you very much. Um, you may have a look at our websites if you want to look more into the examples I've used here. And I also have um, some references in the end for those who are interested in looking into that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Monica. Um, one of the things I really admire about your work is that you don't shy away from complexity. You know, you really dive straight in and you you try and tackle it and, and, and really look for those um, relations. Before I hand over to Margaret, I'm going to take Chair's prerogative and ask a question, if that's OK. Um, I was struck by your talk with, with how much we really needed a paradigm shift in assessment, because everything you talked about in the professions is about in the in, in, in the post digital is about the increasing complexity of the epistemic practices, increased actors, the knowledge objects. And yet, where we're heading in assessment is an increase in um, reductionism and fragmentation in, in learning outcomes and rubrics that try and, and, and separate knowledge out and break it down. and. And, and I, I wondered where, how we might move forward with assessment that is supportive. And, and I wondered whether maybe the key was around supporting students in developing knowledge objects, but I wondered whether you wanted to, you could comment a bit on how we might move forward with assessment and what you see as good practice there. Yeah. I guess there, there might be many answers to this uh, problem complex as well. Uh, but I think um, assessment can imbue, be imbued and are imbued with very different purposes. And the control purpose has perhaps taken a bit too much um, dominance over the learning purpose and the facilitating learning purpose. And I know you have worked a lot uh, with those ideas uh, also in the Cradle Center with sustainable assessment and, and seeing this as integrative to learning processes. Um, but I think um, you're right that this um, um, producing of objects, the inquiry oriented activities that we can engage students in are a way of connecting their learning to what is also um, um, linking up and shared in practice terms with workplaces and it can provide opportunities to assess ways of working rather than assessing bits and pieces of factual knowledge or uh, pieces of understanding. Uh, and uh, also then it might lead to an idea of assessment that people actually do think together. That's another challenge. I think that we assess people often individually in higher education while all of these processes are often collaborative and depending on people doing things together. So um, working in project ways, uh, inquiry oriented ways where we keep the collaborative processes up as something that also is assessed for further development might be one one way of thinking perhaps not too concrete but mm. I really like that thank you so much I'll pass on to um, my colleague Margaret Beeman now to facilitate some questions so um, thank you so much for a, for a such a stimulating presentation and I hope I can do both your you, give you the opportunity from, from to, to reflect on these questions well. I'm probably going to present the questions um, as they a little bit as they are. I might I might mix and match them a little but they they're really um, you know, it feels like I'm dealing with such <laughs> for, a, for, a, for a talk on complexity and complex machineries. I feel like we're enacting it as we're speaking. So the first question came from, well, it came very early. And I think it might be quite a um, an interesting one to, um, to reflect on in terms of your last answer about holistic practices. So in addition to assessment, um, Rolla asks, I guess, I wonder if and how university education is keeping up or supporting our graduates for this increasingly complex professional practice landscape. Mm. How are we preparing our students, if at all? Yes. Well, 
one way is perhaps to have um, a better systematic way of bringing actors in higher education and work context together around shared projects. So um, it might be, for instance, the expectation that more programs have practicums. The, it might be the expectation that people from the professional work sites come into the universities and contribute to the teaching, contribute to the assessment of students' projects, that these boundaries are kind of permitted more and people can move across and see their engagement in the professional community as something that works together. It may also, of course, be about recognizing students' uh, work experiences as part of their learning experiences. Uh, and it can be about um, how we use digital technologies also to come across these boundaries. So, for instance, when we studied the activities in the software engineering program, the teachers very deliberately um, guided the students into professional web pages where they could find resources that also professionals use. Uh, Stack Overflow is one, GitHub is one. So they use tools and areas in their student work that also are important in the professional work practices. So moving actors, moving resources, recognizing activities as learning activities is perhaps one way. Such a wonderful answer. And um, I, again, I'm going to take Chairs Brogdon and ask something on the end of that, which is to say that lots of our students aren't enrolled in professional courses. Mm -hmm. What? How do they manage? They walk into an, an equally complex epistemic workplaces, and yet, you know, do you see any possibility for them in terms of? Yes. Yeah, I highlighted the professionals here because they are complex also in the composition of uh, different knowledge domains and actors and, and purposes of the work. But in, in more uh, discipline specific communities, for instance, uh, then uh, there has been a long history of um, recognizing the epistemic processes and practices that generate knowledge. If you are in a biology lab or if you um, also if you study linguistics, what type of analytical approaches are valid in that domain to analyze texts. So I think actually that the disciplines in many cases have been more familiar with thinking about what they do in epistemic practice terms, uh, even if they have perhaps not used that concept, but they have been closer to science somehow and to, to research areas. Um, but uh, there too, I think the main challenge is to focus on what the students are doing when they are working mm -hmm. with knowledge. Uh, so another, again, move away from the traditional lecture and the um, transmission of information way of thinking to what are students doing with different knowledge sources? How can we involve them in inquiries and uh, uh, explorative activities? And here, I think it's really important to, to also think about what role the digital can play, because there is a danger, for instance, during the lockdown, as we saw here in Norway, that we actually go back to more traditional ways of lecturing mm -hmm. in the Zoom environment. And what was falling out of the picture were perhaps these more inquiry-oriented activities that are sometimes easier to facilitate in face-to-face -face environments. But I think it's absolutely possible to also facilitate them in digital environments, but then we need to think about what tools, what technologies are important for this domain to learn to use this type of instrument or, or tool in inquiry processes. And I, so I'm going to ask the next question because it kind of flows on from that a little bit. And this is from Chia Dachi. She asks, these epistemic practices within activity systems, so drawing on, on that framework, are also governed by rules regulating the systems. I wonder in the context of higher education and work practices, what sort of rules we need to be aware of? Because I think um, that comes to, as well, the shift from the embodied to the digital. I mean, the rules and the tools are gonna to shift. Yes, yes. Yeah, that's a very interesting question. I think there are many different rules and sets of rules that are at play. So, of course, the, all the kind of standards and also norms that comes with ethical challenges are important here. And then I think uh, it has to do, of course, with uh, 
with um, the way we share and generate knowledge for what purposes, purposes and who benefits from, from this. But it also has to do with what are the regulations that are uh, embedded in the different technology systems. So yeah. um, what governs this algorithm? Uh, how does efficiency come into the play in um, technology supported healthcare when we pretend to do good care, for instance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so the value shifts and transformations that come into play. But of course, there might also be other rule sets for work and education uh, activities. So that uh, the way, um, uh, for instance, when we come to assessment and exams, that we have to assess students and kind of um, uh, recognize their learning in a formal way in an educational system that differs from how we recognize learning and place emphasis on that in a work context, for instance. So yeah, there might be colliding uh, purposes and rule systems as well. But I yeah. think working on more common objects to use the activity theory term <laughs> can, <laughs> can be a way around it. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, a, again, a nice practical, and yet, I mean, sometimes I'm, I'm feeling the complexity you describe, in some ways we need quite simple solutions, and, and that, is, that is one. Um, following on from that a little, Anastasia asks, who deals with the challenges to professional expertise? So I guess this is, in a sense, um, the, the rules that, that, that uh, you know, the, you've talked about the evolving nature of professional expertise, but obviously some of those things are, evolution is never, <laughs> it's not always straightforward. Um, and the question asks university students, policymakers, employers, or someone else. So, yeah. yeah. Well, I think it requires engagement from multiple actors, actually. Uh, it's faced by students and professionals uh, as challenges to actually how to, uh, how to find information, how to keep up and how to, um, how to learn. But I think also that it needs to be recognized from um, the program leaders and the university uh, actors that uh, sets the kind of frames for what we can do and not do in educational activities. Um, having, uh, for instance, a sufficient flexibility in the arrangement so that teachers and students can develop projects in collaboration with work contexts, can uh, move on to do something unexpected and not be too, um, too pre-planned of everything uh, is one sense. So, so one example could be, for instance, how do we think about learning outcomes descriptions? Do they, <laughs> do they provide space for people to, to move along and keep up and change? Uh, again, with uh, an example from the software education domain, um, what the program leaders there told us some years back now was that they never wanted to formulate precise learning outcomes <laughs> mm -hmm. because the technologies shifted on the way and they would have to kind of rewrite literally their, their curriculum documents every year because there were many shifts going on. So rather they kept descriptions quite generic and then they invited people from the workplaces to take part in the activities and bring new things into the, into the learning activities of the students. So, but it needs an awareness from different parts of this machinery. Mm. So, I mean, that, that's such a concrete way to, to manage the dynamism of, um, of, the, of, of this sort of shift, shifting expertise. Um, and um, I, I sort of on, a, on another note here, and I think quite a different one, um, from Simon Buckingham-Shung. Just as we decide when and how far to trust people with varying levels of expertise and transparency, so we will learn how such tools should be regarded. So as intelligent tools become part of the workplaces, newcomers will surely learn how that profession forms relationships with some tool, with such tools. I guess to reframe it in more of a question, uh, more of a sort of active question, um, format is how will newcomers come to learn how those professions form these relationships with tools? Yeah. Well, first, I think it's still important to recognize that people are newcomers. Mm. Uh, we have had a debate in Norway, and I don't know if you have had the same in Australia, but there are some tendencies for employers to kind of think that when people graduate, they are ready-made <laughs> for work and they can 
do everything from day one, kind of. <laughs> so uh, um, actually recognizing that people are newcomers and that they should probably, preferably also be uh, working with people that are more experienced. Uh, and those who are more experienced could be more also aware of uh, articulating what is going on, because there might be many things that are inscribed in technologies and which we trust information systems and so on, but making this more transparent might require articulation work. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. So that uh, looking, uh, looking at what is going on in the ongoing activity could be one thing, but also perhaps to have discussions at workplaces where, where people talk about what are we doing here and why, <laughs> and what can we benefit from these, these different tools. Um, and then I think it's important to also think about this as not one phase, because people will move in and out of different positions of expertise throughout working lives. So you might be very experienced one day and then you come the next day in another activity and the kind of challenge of also recognizing the different positions and um, uh, perhaps deliberately also organizing so that people can move in different areas as a way of learning and cater for lifelong learning then can be important. I'm not sure if I responded precisely to the question, but. <laughs> I think you did, because I think I think it sounds like to me, like it's caught up in the dynamism of that shift. And as newcomers come in, intelligent tools like everything else uh, need to have appropriate um, framing and introduction within within the setting is kind of how I'm, I'm hearing, I'm hearing it, your answer. Um, and sort of um I, I i wondered a little bit um you did, uh, those are kind of in in your research did you see any dissonances on this front because that would be an ideal situation but we heard from someone one of the research papers today a vet of how they were a vet they got their they got their diploma and then they were bang a vet and they had to go out and be a vet and how challenging that was and um and, and how much dissonance that caused. Did you see any dissonances in your data set? And what were they? Um, yes, there has been dissonances in, in many ways. Um, for instance, when we go to these uh, work activities that we now study in the so-called corpus project, we can see also a resistance to take new technologies into use and an, um, a fright that they will take away the common human relationships. <laughs> mm -hmm. So that's one dissonance. So, so kind of uh, working with people to see what is the use of this and how is it actually also beneficial for the users is, is a way around. Uh, I guess that is known from other healthcare settings and sometimes also with very good reasons. So after all, there are also economy pressures behind <laughs> these developments. <laughs> uh, and in the um, university settings, we have seen also dissonances between um, within student groups that some people are, some students are very much um, capable of taking on the responsibilities that is inquiry ways of working demand from them and others are more resistant and wants to be told what to do uh, and this also creates some tensions in the relationship between teachers and students so what should be guided what should be told and what is whose responsibilities so um, I think there too it's uh, important to kind of clarify expectations and making explicit why are we working in the way we are working and what is then expected of you and what will the teacher provide because uh, um, it might feel a bit frightening to lose the control in a way yeah. in a more open explorative way. Mm. Frightening but hopefully thrilling. Um, the, the, the last question I think is around it comes to that a little bit which is uh, what differences might you see Judy asks in the levels of education i.e diploma which is um, not within the university sector, to degree, which is your undergraduate, and then into postgraduate when starting to rethink higher education. I think you mentioned just before that people um, have different capabilities. Does that also match according to the level, the level of education that they're at? Uh, it might be, but I think perhaps here it's important to also think about the domain and mm. what the knowledge structures in the domain, because some areas are more demanding uh, in, the, in the way that you need some kind of entrance level to be able to 
take part in inquiring activities, for instance, while others are more open that you can start on different um, levels to do so. So I do think that uh, the knowledge structures and the way they are more cumulative or more horizontally organized, to, to use that language, <laughs> uh, matters for when people can enter in what activities. But uh, common to everyone, I think, is to see them the meaning of the activity they are doing in the moment in a wider perspective and being a bit more aware of what are people producing together or generating together in in a profession or, or um, expert domain is also motivating in that sense to learn about other actors in this machinery and to learn about um, what people do at different levels uh, also to see the qualification routes that can be inspiring for one's own development. I think that's a great point to throw that to you, Rola. Thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, Monica. Um, it's been a, a wonderful uh, discussion through from theory right down to really some practical and, and thoughtful uh, ways of actually putting some of this stuff to work. Um, I think what we gain in, in having access to this talk to a really wide range of people we lose in their bodied um, responses that we unfortunately cannot see, but I've certainly really enjoyed your presentation and, and Twitter has, has um, the conversation has gone really strongly. So thank you again um, for your keynote and um, hope you have a rest of a great day. Thank Many you. Thanks. Thank you. Um, and with that, I'd like to pass over to Professor David Ballard, who will um, lead us through the final session. Thanks, David. Yes, always unmute yourself first. Um, thanks very much for that, Rola. Um, this is the final session. It's the last session of the day of the, of the conference. And it really has two things. Uh, the most important thing is the book launch, uh, but there is a little bit of uh, wrapping up in the final session. Before we move into the book launch, I I'd like to kind of pose a question to participants. And that is, this is my first experience of being in a conference um, in Zoom as distinct from Zoom in all its other modes. And I'm starting to think there are some advantages of doing this over the normal face-to-face -face conference, and there are some disadvantages. And I'd be very interested in your comments, and you can post them um, in Slido, about what is it that this particular mode of conference is good for, and indeed what it isn't good for. Uh, I've got some very clear ideas on that for myself, but I'd be very interested in, in kind of what thoughts you have on that. So, that is something I will return to um, in the very, very final wrap up, which, which will only be a few minutes at the end. What I'd like to do now is to introduce the book launch. And I'm going to put up the picture of the book, of course, which is uh, what we most need. He said. There we are. My screen's gone completely blank at the moment. So what I'd like to do is to introduce you to our person who will launch the book, and that person is Bella Beverly Oliver. Now, Beverly is very well known throughout the higher education sector in Australia as a leader of innovation and change in higher education, particularly on the teaching and learning and assessment front. Um, she left uh, Deakin, uh, was it last year or thereabouts? Um, where and she's now an emeritus professor at Deakin. Prior to that, she was uh, the deputy vice chancellor of education for Deakin. And those of us in Cradle have a particularly soft spot for her. 
to the person her uh, invented Cradle. She was the person that invited me to um, Deakin. And everything you see today has its origins in the seeds that she, she sowed um, just over five years ago. So it's particularly exciting for us to have Beverly here to launch the book. And the book you see, I hope you can see the image of it um, on your screens, uh, Reimagining University Assessment in a Digital World. And what I'd like to do is to invite Beverly to say some words about it. Uh, after that, Margaret will give a brief, brief response and then I'll just make some final remarks at the end of the conference. Beverly, over to you. Thank you, Dave. Hello, Margaret, and good afternoon and good evening or good morning, wherever you are in the world. And thank you so much. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. And it's nice that you have a soft spot for me because I certainly have a soft spot for Cradle and, of course, Deakin, my former university with which I still have an affiliation, I'm very pleased to say. It's a real honour to be asked to launch this book and uh, it's a real credit to the team. It's not their first book, but it's a really good book. And so I'd like to share a few brief thoughts with you. If you have been at the Cradle Conference for the last two years and, whoops, last two days, and if you're still online now, then you don't need me to persuade you that assessment is at the heart of the higher education experience. Nevertheless, I'm going to say a few words and I don't normally write my words down, but I've written a few down tonight. So I hope you bear with me. I'm reading from an old fashioned thing here called paper because I'm going to quote from some of this, some parts of this book. So reimagining university assessment in a digital world. First of all, I want to congratulate everybody involved, particularly Margaret Beerman, Philip Dawson, Rola Ajawi, Joanna Tai, and David Bowd, the editors, who were so prescient in coming up with this topic. I could say, what were you thinking and what did you know was coming? I'm going to read a excerpt, an excerpt from the introduction to the book, in fact, the very early part of the book, and really, you can imagine that they knew what was on the horizon when they conceived this book. They do address this. They say, this is a time for reimagining. The danger is that in our rush to convert our practices from embodied to digital, that we will simply replicate what has been done. I might add the rest of the book actually suggests that's often what we've done with assessment. The opportunity that we have is that a whole cohort of educators and students, not the early adopters or tech whizzes, but the whole cohort will contribute to the shape of digital learning by sheer necessity. And through this, our sense of what is normal will have changed. We may well discover ways of working with assessment that we had not thought of before, let's hope. We hope that as we emerge from this crisis and tragedy, with new ideas about assessment, which take full account of digital possibilities. This book offers directions, examples, and I like this part, conundrums, to provoke new ways of thinking about assessment in what has become in inescapably, and in, I'll add some words, not always that pleasant digital world. And I refer to Dave's comments about the conference. I've really enjoyed popping in and out of the conference over the last two days. And, you know, I agree with Dave, there are many extra good things that you can do. You can go back and watch things. You can go back and watch things after they've happened. But at the same time, you can't just go off into a room and chat with your colleagues and catch up and do all those things. So what I'd like to do is just give you a little uh, preview of what's in the book very briefly. And that is that there are five parts in this book. There's a, a really solid introduction. And I do recommend particularly chapter two. If you don't read anything else in the book, read chapter two, because that's where the editors actually set out what, what the scope of this is, what they mean by assessment, what they mean by digital and the digital world. But also it sets out the philosophical underpinnings of what comes. 
After that, there's a second part on the changing role of assessment and digital learning. And this includes things like topics we've just heard discussed in the last two days, like learning analytics and artificial intelligence. And I, for one, am intrigued as to how that might have implications for practice. Part three is the role of big data in reimagining assessment. And part four is a part I particularly like, and that's practical examples because being able to see and understand what other people are actually doing and what they're finding already by pioneering in this place is really helpful to all of us. Part five is setting the agenda for the future. So I thought I might just finish up by sharing some thoughts with you about what I think the future agenda needs to be because a book, as we all know, has a long gestation period these thoughts have been captured and recorded and now made possible for us to share. But you will already be thinking about what's going to happen post 2020. Where do we go from here? Not just in our conferences, but in our practice, in our scholarship and so on. So these are some thoughts from me and they're not uh, mind blowingly new. Some of them I'm sure you've heard before. And that is in my way of thinking credentials plus experience I'll just say that again, credentials, micro or macro, plus experience are a bridge to employment. And in the wider world in which we operate, employment is now really writ large and urgent for so many people. Because people are in distress, they're displaced, they're worried. Government subsidies are going to finish and people need to shore up their their paid employment, basically. It's not always paid, but let's say employment, paid employment. Now, when you think about this, and I know Dave and I have had this discussion over the years, a credential of any kind is usually comprised of assessment marks, because in reality, you sign up for a course, you do all the assessment tasks, the numbers get added up, added up and I can hear Dave's voice in chapter two of the book, reminding us that this is not what we hope for, in fact, I will share with you that Dave suggested to me once when I was the Deputy Vice Chancellor at Deakin that we should get rid of marks and grades and just go to better outcomes and standards and artefacts. And I thoroughly agreed with him, but I did remind him I actually like having a job and some steps were just a bridge too far at the time. But Dave, I do really believe that that is the way things should be. How do we get there though? Because as you point out in the book, and certainly one of the things that I experienced is that the roots of tradition, and I'll come back to this in a minute, are cast in concrete and very deeply in universities particularly. Before I leave my train of thought though, credentials and experience are what leads to employment. And you might think that doing a PhD or getting a peer reviewed assessment of your article or your final exams are the big assessment tasks. But I put to you as working adults that you are being assessed every day as a worker. We're always making judgments about each other's performance. People are sometimes giving you feedback verbally, sometimes it's silent, and sometimes not even very constructive. However, that is the world and how it works and credentials and employment must be, I think, or will inevitably become, be, become more closely linked. So I think future fit education needs to come to terms with this whole array. Now, it's not all about employment, but that is the concern of most people most of the time when they are undertaking a university education. And as the authors of the book point out, and as Liz mentioned yesterday in her opening, the current university systems that we work in are not always working as well as they should. And now they're going to have to change more rapidly because apart from anything else, not only has higher education work changed itself, universities have operated really quite differently this year. World, the work, working world has changed. The way you do work has changed. And now, if you don't have access to digital, it's like access to electricity. You can't actually work because 
I'm sitting in my own home using digital and electricity in order to be able to talk to you now. And if I didn't have those things, I wouldn't be able to do it. And there are many who don't have them. So if work has changed, work integrated learning has to change because work is different. Assessment must change. The whole focus on employability must change. So I, I'm going to move now to something not so um, happy. And that is some of the fears I have as we go into a pretty tough area is that some of the assessment that needs to change is actually going to be really grim because as universities go through a really tough period now, financially tough and industrially tough periods, there is a chance that we will revert to the known. And my bet noir is that we will revert to more automated, inexpensive, computer automated quizzes, which will actually take cost out of the business. So I'm going to urge you, because if you've sat through all of this and you're still listening to me, you are already a disciple of great assessment. So I'm going to urge you, as you collectively and collaboratively shape and research the future of assessment, that you give some thought to not just researching and not just trying to persuade your colleagues to try new ways of assessing because they're good people. They are good people, but they're going to be under a lot more pressure. We need to actually come up with some hard evidence that the better ways of assessing people are actually more cost effective because you're going to have to win that argument to get a whole university to change its way of doing things. So that's one way, cost effective assessment methods. And secondly, it's going to have to go to the heart of industrial agreements, another bet noir of mine. Workload models often have assessment as the only bit you can dial up or dial down. And guess what happens in hard times? The time you get to spend assessing a student in a semester workload model gets dialed down because you can do it. And yet that's counterintuitive because the feedback, the constructive advice that you give to a student who's on the learning journey is the most valuable thing I think that goes on and it's at the very heart of an education for employment, for learning, for whatever purpose it is. It really is that. I don't want to end on a really sad note, so I'll leave it there. But I do urge you, uh, as a disciple of great assessment, which you undoubtedly are, I do urge you to read this book, ask your library to purchase this book, or even purchase chapters yourself if you have to. But Use your networks, share the outcomes, and join in the effort for not just this conversation, but the next one. Where are we going to go with assessment and how are we going to make it more effective and a better experience for everyone, learners and educators as well? I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much. And it's my absolute pleasure. And I'm going to finish by actually saying to launch this book. Thank you very much for asking me. Thank you very much, Beverly. Um, we can imagine the metaphorical champagne flowing now. One of the things that we can't do in this mode is to have the drinks that would normally be associated with a book launch. Um, what we can do at the moment is to pass over to Margaret, who will uh, make some uh, remarks on behalf of the editors. Thanks so much, Beverly. And I think I think you've you've raised a really important issue around um, technology, which is that you know we we. And, and and assessment is that we live in the cold hard reality of um, of of the, the the sector and at the moment that reality is particularly cold and particularly hard as it, as are many people's lives and in that circumstance I think that reimagining is really important because it's not just about the dollars, it's also about the hope that it gives us and the fact that so many people in the sector do things because they believe in them, not just because they're cost efficient. And I think for me, I have faith in that. And although I have lived in lean times in academia, I don't know whether I will have lived through a time this lean, but it's always been a sustaining thread. People are in this job because they care, they care about making things better, they care about the increasing knowledge, teaching students um, and 
let me just say it, making the world a better place. So there's some rainbows and sunshine for us against the cold reality. But I also want to say, sort of to bring us back down to a slightly more, uh, bring us back down to earth a bit, that in writing this book, it was really hard. Reimagining is really difficult. It, it came, the, the book came from an observation that we sort of jointly had that the fields of what you might loosely call assessment for learning and loosely call educational technology without putting too strict labels on them, they really weren't in dialogue with each other. And I think we really wanted to connect them and, and, and feel that by marrying them together, they could be bigger than what they were individually so that um, assessment hadn't really um, considered how technology might expand what it did and technology tended to build on a model of assessment that was long gone. So we really wanted to say, well, if you, if you took the past out of the equation, where would you be? And it's actually a really difficult thing to do, but I think the book actually comes at it for all the sweat that was um, built into it. And there's plenty of great work from people you may have seen at this conference, Lois Harris, Marcus O'Donnell, Simon Knight, Linda Corrin. We have um, Bart Rientes from the Open University, some work. Um, Rosemary Luckin contributed, Ed Pitt from University of Kent, Naomi Winston from University of Surrey. So we have some wonderful contributors thinking about these questions. And I think what's interesting is as well is not only we're asking to do something different, we wanted to go into that rainbow aspiration of doing things better and to build something better that hadn't been thought of before. So blue skies imaginings in there, practical exemplars in there of ways that things that are happening now and a range of work that sits in the between place. And I think the one thing that this book really did for us, and I'll speak on behalf of Cradle here, the Cradle editorial team, is it really crystallised the importance of this notion that brought us to this conference, that the digital is all around us and that assessment and learning and teaching needs to take more account of it. Um, we don't think enough about the, edu the, the, the administrative bureaucracies and they, they have a huge impact on what assessment is. The grades that need to be entered actually trickle all the way backwards into the assessment that we offer. So when we reimagine, we need to think about reimagining across the scale in, in this digitally imbued landscape that, that we live in, which is really the theme of this conference. So I'm not gonna talk any much longer than that because it's, it's getting on and we need to shut down. So I'm, thank you, Beverly. I'm so delighted. People, I will, um, I will put up the, if you go to the Cradle website, there is a link to the book if you want a discount voucher. Just, sorry, last minute plug. Um, I'm really proud of this book. I'm really proud of the team. I'm really proud of the authors. So thank you so much, Beverly, for launching and back to you, Dave. Okay, thanks uh, very much, Margaret. And uh, thank you, Beverly. One of the things I, I, I should mention is that uh, Beverly's doing some very interesting work currently on uh, the role of micro-credentials in higher education. So just Google her name and micro-credentials and you will be able to access all sorts of very interesting resources and ideas and position papers uh, on that theme. Because that's one of the things that we're grappling with as a sector and as a country right now. Well, that's the end of the book launch. Just moving now into the very, very final few minutes of the conference. I'm reflecting on the transition we made. We planned this conference for face-to-face. Um, -face. We planned to hold it in the building that is behind me, an image of it behind me uh, at Deakin downtown. And we arranged it to be for quite limited numbers. And we're assuming that it would be a fairly uh, local conference, local to Australia as distinct from uh, largely international. What we have is a much more international conference than we ever anticipated. We've got many more participants than we could have imagined. And we've got the program, which is not terribly different from what we would have had face to face in terms of the content. So we're quite pleased that we've managed to uh, struggle through 
and do the uh, emergency remote conference organizing uh, that we've had to do for our teaching this year anyway. So I think what it does is it opens up interesting dimensions for conferences, not just of this type, because this type is a, is a substitute. It wasn't actually designed to be an online conference from the start. So if we are going to introduce and develop online conferences or mini conferences or how we want to organize them, we need to kind of learn from our experience. And there's some very interesting comments and reactions posted of things that people think work well in this mode and things which don't work so well in this mode. So we're going to think about that. We're not going to commit at the moment to do another conference, um, although I anticipate in the future we will have many conference-like events, uh, whatever that means. Um, so watch this space for those. Very final thing I want to say is to thank some of the key players. Margaret Beerman is one of the key players here. She was the lead on organising the whole event. She was the person that convened us, brought us together, got us to do various jobs and got the programme in the wonderful shape that it has. The, pro, the person that made that all happen, who translated that into something which worked both organisationally and technically, is Paige Marnie. And Paige is the person you would have had contacts with um, regarding the conference. So I'd like to give a particular thanks to Paige for her enormous effort that she's put into this. And Paige won't be with us in that role uh, very much longer. So I'd particularly like to thank you, Paige, for all the contributions you've made to Cradle since you've been with us. And the other person I just want to mention at the end is the person that was our backup person. Um, if Paige fell over, if something happened, there was a person that would catch things, and that's Kevin Dullahan. And Kevin has been invisible to you, but he's been there, and we've been very reassured by him being there, because it means that if anything had gone wrong, we had some depth of capacity to deal with it. So thank you for those who organised the conference. Thank you for coming. Your participation is absolutely vital. And for me, there was a much higher level of participation in some ways than there is face to face. And that's going to be the interesting thing as we move forward on this. How can we capture some of the really good things that work for a conference in this mode? And how can we find a path back to face to face conferences that are not where they where they were in the past, but where they are in a digital world. So thank you for participation.